Thank you, Soren. Uh, so welcome to, uh, to Great uh, 2018, everyone. Thanks to, how many of you have been to uh, Great EU before? Yeah, so that's probably 90% of the people. That's fantastic. Uh, the, the guys and gals who run, uh, uh, run Great EU do a super fantastic job uh, of this every year. And uh, I know I speak for uh, the OCI team for sure, and I think I speak for the community um, at large that, uh, in, in thanking them for putting this on every year. It's just a, so you guys do a super fantastic job every year, and uh, uh, the community thanks you, and uh, as does OCI, and I do personally. So th thanks to, to all the, the whole team here at, uh, uh, at Great EU for putting on a great show. Um, so most of you were probably in uh, Graham's uh, keynote this morning, and uh, so Graham provided a, uh, a pretty quick but uh, somewhat thorough overview of a lot of the capabilities uh, that are present in, uh, in Micronaut. So as, uh, as all of you know, uh, just a couple of days ago, so about 36 hours ago, I think, uh, we shipped uh, the first milestone of Micronaut. Um, so 1.0.0.m1 is the latest version of Micronaut, and that's the milestone that we just shipped uh, a few days ago. Um, we've been working on Micronaut for a long time. Uh, development started uh, last year, and uh, we were, uh, uh, we've just been investing uh, uh, most of our effort into getting the thing to where it is right now, and we're uh, super excited to finally get to a point where we can start releasing some of this stuff. So all the source code is open source. It's all out on GitHub. 100% of it's out there. Um, the milestone's out there now. Uh, now that uh, we've shipped the milestone, we're back into snapshot publishing mode. So as changes are made to the framework, 1.0.0.snapshot will be updated, published automatically, and people can keep up with uh, uh, whatever uh, evolves over the, the coming months as we, we close in on uh, releasing uh, 1.0 GA uh, later this year. Um, but with all of this effort being invested in Micronaut, and it's taken a lot to build this thing, this is not a, um, you can tell just from looking at the demos this morning, this is not a, a weekend project that could be knocked together in, uh, uh, by a couple of folks in, in a few weekends. This is a substantial development effort uh, to build this thing. Um, and uh, so that's taken a, a lot of our focus in, uh, in recent months. And uh, as Graham said that this, uh, this morning, uh, as, as we press on through the year, we're going to be able to redirect a lot of that focus back towards, uh, towards Grails. We've got a lot of really exciting stuff coming in Grails, uh, Grails 4, which is targeted to ship later this year. That'll include the spring and groovy updates that Graham mentioned. So I won't re uh, restate everything that, that was uh, described in the, in the keynote already, um, but we're going to be able to get back to um, uh, uh, closing the gap between uh, where we are now and what needs to be in place before we can ship uh, Grails 4. Um, so to be clear, uh, we're investing in, in both of these technologies considerably. Um, and, and specifically, I want to be clear that we're not uh, backing away from Grails. We're not lessening our investment there. We've had to redirect some stuff in recent months just to get Micronaut where it is, as I said. But Grails is still a really important part of, uh, of what we do. Um, Micronaut um, is... Uh, in, in the, there's certainly some overlap between Micronaut and Grails, but these are, these are very different frameworks. They take different approaches to solving problems, and they really target different kinds of applications. Right? So in a, in a nutshell, we'll say that Micronaut is a, it's a JVM-based framework, just like Grails is. It's a full-stack framework, so we've got a DI container and, and ORM integration. We've got a lot of the, the same kinds of things that make up the full stack for Grails. Um, some of the attributes that Micronaut has that uh, distinguish itself from Grails include uh, really fast startup times, um, tiny processes, uh, as, uh, as you've seen mentioned already, um, and a lot of that comes from getting rid of all of the reflection, right? Grails relies heavily on runtime reflection for a lot of the cool stuff that it does, and that enables lots of cool capabilities, but that comes at a cost, and that cost is runtime performance and memory consumption. So getting rid of all that runtime reflection uh, is where a lot of the benefits in, in Micronaut come from. Um, we've got our own DI container, so we've got no dependency on uh, uh, Spring or Juice or any other DI container. Certainly, so you could use uh, Spring in a Micronaut app if you wanted to, but uh, DI, uh, Micronaut, Micronaut has its own DI container, right? So we don't have a dependency on that, uh, all that uh, outside stuff in order to get the capability that we want in, in the framework. We've got really sophisticated load balancing stuff. 
And by the way, some of that, maybe some of you have seen at the, the OCI table out here, um, that little contraption that, uh, with a bunch of raspberry pies in it. Um, come by later today, and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about what's going on there. But what we've got is a, a bunch of Raspberry Pis and uh, different Micronaut apps running on all of them. And one of the things I want to be able to demonstrate there is uh, how, the, how the load balancing works, the client-side HTTP load balancing. And some of it's easier to talk about when we're out there in front of it. So come by and, and check on that. But in short, what's happening is we've got a really simple application with a front end, an edge controller, and then a bunch of services behind it and we can interact with the front end and see the data coming from those back end services and then we can just unplug one of the Raspberry Pis. So basically taking the machine out of the mix and see how, the, uh, how, how that can be a seamless thing for the application to deal with. Um, so come by and, and uh, th there's a lot more to, to press into and I'd, so I'd love to talk to you about that, uh, that demo that we've got set up out there. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. But uh, so Micronaut, as I said, has some overlap with Grails, but it's, it's also its own thing, right? Micronaut is not, um, uh, it's not the successor to Grails. That They target two different audiences, and it turns out that it's not Micronaut or Grails. Um, for a lot of applications, Micronaut's going to be exactly the right thing to do. For a lot of applications, Grails is going to be exactly uh, the right thing to do. And for some applications, you'll want to mix these things together. And that's some of what I want to, want to talk about today. But at the, at the highest level, kind of the most, the, the most simple way that we can relate these two frameworks to each other is Grails is, uh, is, is really great for uh, uh, so-called monolithic web apps. And Micronaut is really great for microservice architectures. So the, the word monolith has, uh, in, in recent years, has taken on uh, sort of some negative connotations. And so try not to get hung up on those negative connotations that have been attached to the word monolith. Uh, what a monolith is, is it's a certain architect, it's a certain way to architect, uh, say, a web app. Could be other apps too, but what we're talking about web apps, where you've got a war file that has everything you need in it, all of your business logic, all your services, everything's in that war file. You deploy that to a server container, that's a, that's a monolithic uh, web app, and that's traditionally how Grails apps have been built. Um, uh, have been built. Uh, so Grails is over 10 years old. People have been building those kinds of apps with Grails for that whole 10 years, and people will continue to want to build those kinds of apps. Um, there are applications for which that's the right approach, where breaking the thing up into a bunch of microservices is not the right thing to do, right? Microservices are not always the right answer to uh, how to get where you want to be. There, there are costs associated with microservices, and for some applications, those costs don't make sense. So people will continue to build um, so-called monolithic web apps, and Grails will continue to be great for that. Micronaut is really great for building microservices, and these two play well together. And uh, I want to spend a little bit of time just demonstrating a little bit of that. Th this is kind of the extent of the, the slides that I'm going to go through. We're just going to jump into an IDE and take a look at uh, some stuff that's uh, semi-developed right now. It's developed enough that it's demonstrable and, and operational. But what I want to demonstrate will give you a sense for uh, just one of the ways that Grails and Micronaut integrate well uh, with, uh, with each other. So let me open up a browser here and see what I've got as a starting point. I think I've already got, all right. So I've, I, I've got console running already, and you'll see there are two services here. The console itself is one of the services, and I've also got a service called synth-data, and we'll see what that's all about in just a minute. If I go to localhost 8080 and look here, See if that's up and running right now, and it is. All right, so uh, I'm going to, we're going to step through code and figure out what, what, all, is, uh, what all is happening and, and what role Micronaut is playing in this. But what I've got here are two separate Grails applications. I've got a Grails application serving up the, the front end that we're looking at, and when I load this page, all the data that you see uh, listed on this page, it's a list of um, analog synthesizers, um, that data is being retrieved from a backend service. So I've got a Grails REST API profile application running, and then separate from that, I've got a Grails web profile application running, and the web profile app is making REST calls to the REST API app to get this data, right? Hopefully that makes sense. There's two apps, a web app, a REST API app. Neither of them are Micronaut apps. They're both Grails apps, and 
the web app is making REST calls to the, uh, to the REST API app to retrieve the data that, uh, that, that we're looking at here. So uh, let's take a look at what it takes to make all that happen and what role Micronaut or a part of Micronaut uh, is playing in, in enabling all that. So first I want to look at this backend uh, Grails application. Remember, it's not a Micronaut app, it's a, it's a Grails application. And in this uh, backend uh, Grails application, I've expressed a dependency on uh, the Spring Cloud Starter Console All package that you see there expressed on line uh, 67. So Spring Boot, uh, it, so most of you are probably aware that Grails 3 is built on top of Spring Boot, right? So a Grails 3 application is a Spring Boot application, and anything you can do in Spring Boot, you can do in a Grails 3 app, because a Grails 3 app is a Spring Boot app. Um, and that, that's one of the big reasons that we built Grails 3 on top of Spring Boot, was to get to take advantage of everything that Boot had to offer. And here's an example of that. So one of the things that I want this Grails application to do is at application startup time, I want it to register itself with console, right? So I've added this Spring Cloud Starter console dependency to my project. And aside from that, the only other thing I had to do to this Grails application to make it register with console is annotate the main application class that's in this project with uh, at enable discovery client. And we'll see that's in a package that says something about Spring Cloud there, right? So that, that's coming from that dependency that we just looked at in build.gradle. So if you create a uh, Grails application, add that dependency, and annotate your main application class with enable discovery client, your, uh, when that application starts up, it will um, uh, register itself with console. And there are some properties you can define to tell it where to find your console. Uh, by default, it's, uh, the project is looking for localhost colon 8500, and that's where my console happens to be running, so I don't need any special config to express that. But this, when I look at this console interface here, the, the thing synth-data, that's a Grails 3 applica it's the Grails 3 application that we're, we were just looking at, right? So other than that, other than the, the two things that I just pointed out, and that is the uh, dependency in build.gradle and this annotation here, it's just, uh, there's nothing else special about it. It's just a Grails application that was built with a REST API profile, and in the Grails application, I've got a simple domain class that represents a, th a synthesizer, and that domain class is annotated with that resource, so this application is providing a REST API for managing those synthesizers, right? And that REST API is registering itself with console, so now I can write other applications that go to console and say, give me the synth data service. And I don't, I don't know where it is. That, that's the reason console's involved. You're asking console, hey, get, get me connected to the synth data service. And console will say, Here, here's one that's running. And then the client can uh, make calls to it because the client discovered it through the service discovery system. That, that's what console does, one, one of the things that console does. So that, that's just the back end. So if we wanted to write a front end that wanted to call this thing, um, one thing we've got to do is the front end needs to be able to find this thing, right? So that's why we're using console. The front end is going to reach out to console and say, hey, give me the synth data service, and uh, I want to make, make calls to that. So if we, now if we leave the back end and go to the front end, this is the web application that is in the, um, uh, that we're looking at that's providing this uh, user interface right there, right? We're looking at the web app now. If I look at its build.gradle, we'll see, remember this is a Grails app, not a Micronaut app. Um, but in the Grails app, I'm expressing a dependency on some Micronaut libraries. And really the one that's, uh, that, uh, the two that I want to focus on here are these two. All four are required, but I want to talk about the discovery client dependency and the spring dependency. Um, so Spring, it, this is not the Spring framework, right? This is a Micronaut artifact called Spring. It's in the io.micronaut group. Um, that module right now, only, it only contains three or four classes, I think. It's a pretty small module, but it, it contains some classes that relate to Spring, and that's one of the things we're going to press into and look at here. Uh, that's going to be uh, a key piece of getting... Um, uh, of Micronaut being able to simplify this Grails application uh, ar architecture here. So we've got a, a dependency on Micronaut's Spring library and a dependency on the discovery client. In this Grails, uh, Grails application, we've got 
this guy. Uh, this is really, as benign as that is, an interface with one method in it, uh, doesn't look very interesting. Th this is really the most interesting part of the whole contraption. Um, or, yeah, certainly it's on the short list. So I've got an interface here annotated with at clients. And it's, uh, this one happens to be written in Java, I think. Yep, it's written in Java. It could be written in Groovy. Um, this one's written in Java. Um, so I've got an interface called synth client. And I've annotated the interface with at client synth data. So that synth data is the name of the remote service that I want this client to be associated with. Right? It's the name of the remote service. It's actually the name that will be sent to console. It's, it's this name right here. Right? So when my application starts up, the UI uh, application is going to go to console and say, hey, give me wh where are the synth data services? Um, and we'll get an object um, that implements this interface that's connected to that remote service. So let me fill in the other pieces of the puzzle here and, and uh, I promise this will all make sense. So inside of this interface that's marked with that client, I've got a single abstract method, right? It's called get synthesizers. It returns a list of synthesizer and synthesizer is just a class. It's not a domain class. It's just a class that's inside of this uh, web UI. Uh, the web UI is not using GORM. Remember, all the data that it's getting is coming from that backend service. Right, so this is not a GORM entity. I can't save it. I can't query for it. It's just a structure that represents data that I'm getting from the back end. Um, so this, this interface is um, at compile time because we've expressed the dependency on the corresponding um, Micronaut uh, libraries. At compile time, a new class will be created that implements this interface, and it has all the logic that's involved in making the remote uh, REST calls. Remember, we're inside of a Grails app, and all this is still going to work. Um, so that's our interface. Then in the uh, web app, I've got a single controller called Synthesizer Controller. And I'm auto-wiring that synth client into this controller, right? So the synth client, this is the interface we were just looking at. That's this guy right here. I want that to be auto-wired into, into this controller. And when I send a request to the index page, what I want to happen is I want to invoke the get synthesizers method on that client. The, the result of that expression that's highlighted right now is an HTTP call is going to be made to some server whose location and port number I don't know about ahead of time, right? That was all discovered. It's going to all be discovered at runtime. Um, so when line 13 executes, an HTTP call will be made to that remote service we'll get back a list of synthesizers and we can do whatever we want to do with them, right? In this case, I'm simply passing them to the, to the respond method. Uh, but again, that, that's, so line 13 looks like a totally benign, uninteresting line of code. That's, that's what's triggering all the interesting stuff, right? That's going to make the remote rest call. And it's Micronaut that's making that so simple, right? The only remoting code that we've written in this client application is this interface, right? just defines the methods that we want to be able to call. So when I call this method, uh, a, a, a get request will be sent to slash synths below wherever this service was found, right? Some machine, some port number, slash synths. Uh, that's where the get request will be called when I invoke get synthesizers, and that's what's happening right here. So all the remote code we've written is we wrote this interface and annotated it with that client. And now I can inject that uh, client into a controller or a service or any place else in a Grails application where DI is happening. And I've got a really simple way to um, make that uh, remote HTTP call. And all the service discovery stuff is just happening automatically. Um, we're not, uh, Micronaut is managing all that for us. Um, so the, in order to make all this work, um, there's one kind of key trick to the whole thing that is somehow we need to get that, uh, that uh, synth client being added to the spring application context, right? Not the micronaut context, but the spring application context. Um, because if I can get that synth client being in the spring application context, then that client can participate in DI for my controllers and services and all my other stuff inside of a Grails application. So we had to build uh, a small contraption to make that happen. And taking a look at that contraption, will shed a little bit of light uh, or provide some insight on to, on into um, how you can write applications that might not be Grails apps and might not be Grail, uh, Micronaut apps, uh, how you can write applications that take advantage uh, of pieces of Micronaut. So let, let me look at uh, a class in particular and that'll all make more sense. 
So one piece that I did not mention yet um, in the UI application is I'm adding this bean to the Spring application context. So the bean is called HTTP client bean processor. That's just a bean name, could be anything. This is the type that the bean will be an instance of. That's the interesting stuff that we're gonna press into. And the uh, second argument there is a constructor argument. So it turns out that this class, Micronaut Bean, Pro Pro Bean Processor, accepts a class as a constructor argument. And what this Micronaut Bean Processor does is it creates a Micronaut application context. Remember that Micronaut has its own fully featured DI container, dependency injection container, wholly separate from Spring. It doesn't have anything to do with Spring, it's its own thing. Um, and so what this bean processor is going to do is it's going to create one of those Micronaut application contexts and it's gonna find all of the beans of this type. So in this case, client. It's gonna find all of the beans of that type in the Micronaut context and add them as beans to the Spring application context. So, and once they're into the Spring application context, now you're off into Grails land and those things can all be DI'd into your Grails tag libs and services and controllers and so forth. So I'm gonna look at that Micronaut Beam Processor class in, in just a moment and uh, we'll see how that works. But uh, before I get into that, uh, I'll pause for a minute. Any questions or comments about any of this so far? Soren. Yep, uh, so it's a good question. The question is what if the endpoint has security measures in place? And uh, so the uh, HTTP client stuff in Micronaut has, uh, has support for providing um, uh, authorization tokens in the HTTP header so that all the, the authentication stuff is accounted for in the HTTP client stuff. So I haven't worked any of that into this example, um, but the, there's good solutions for all that. And, and as Graham mentioned in the, in the keynote this morning, we've got a whole bunch of Grails guides around security that it's described in the user guide. So there's good solutions for that stuff. Any other questions or comments before I press on? All right, let's take a look at this Micronaut Bean Processor. So this is in that Spring library that's provided by Micronaut. Um, and in that library are, are just three or four classes that do various springy things. And I wanna take a look at, at this one in particular. As I said, uh, this will uh, kind of uh, uh, provide some insight into how you can write applications that might not be Grails apps, might not be Micronaut apps, uh, just some JVM app that might want to take advantage of some piece of, uh, of, of Micronaut. So what is, uh, what is this guy doing? So this is a Spring uh, Bean Factory Post Processor, right? So I want one of these in the Spring application context and early on in the initialization lifecycle uh, uh, that Spring goes through, um, Spring will find all of your Bean Factory Post Processors that are in the context and interact with them and say, okay, here's the bean factory, do whatever you want to do with it. And it will find, but, but the reason that we've got this line of code right here is I want one of those Micronaut bean processors in the Spring application context so it can do what I'm about to describe. Um, so, and the interesting bits are really right here. So we're creating, inside of this Spring bean post processor, we're creating a new Micronaut um, application context. So where that says new default app context, this is a Micronaut app context, not a Spring context. So we're creating the, the Micronaut context, and then I want to retrieve from the uh, context all of the beans of a certain type. So that Micronaut bean qualifier, it's, uh, we'll say for now, what that is, is that's the thing that's gonna find all of our client beans. Right, so Micronaut bean stereotype is the constructor argument that we saw provided earlier. So uh, as I said, let, let's just say that what this is going to return is all of the bean definitions that correspond to client beans. So you might have lots of clients in your Grails app. This is gonna find all of them and this is going to uh, stream through them all for all of them that are singletons. We only care about singletons here in this case. For every one of those, we're gonna create a new spring bean definition and add that bean definition to uh, the context, the spring application context that's being initialized here. So by the time all that gets executed, in the spring application context will be new bean definitions that correspond to all of the client beans that were found inside of the Micronaut spring application context. And now we're, we're just off into, because they're in the spring context, Grails can just go to town and do what it wants to do with them. 
One, and this is all very uh, uh, early access-y stuff. Um, this was, uh, this Bean Pros processor was just added to uh, the core Micronaut Spring Library uh, last week, I think, maybe the week before. Um, there's still some stuff to evolve uh, around this. Uh, there's some limitations and it's inefficient the way that it's implemented. The idea is something that we want implemented and we wanted to get some form of it in milestone one, so that's what you see here. But this is gonna evolve and, and, and uh, get to a point where it provides more capability. But right now, one of the issues is that uh, the bean names for your Micronaut beans um, don't follow the same kind of naming conventions that Grails beans do, right? So if you have a service in your Grails app called Money Service, then there'll be a bean in the Spring application context called Money Service with a lowercase m. Um, and that's not how the Micronaut context uh, works. So you don't, you don't have bean names in the same way that you do with, with Spring. Um, and because of the fact that your Grails artifacts are subjected to auto wire by name. So what that means is when your Grails artifacts are subjected to dependency injection, um, what Spring is gonna do is it's gonna look to see if there's a bean whose name is synth client. And if there is, that bean will be injected into this property. Uh, the bean name will not be synth client. Uh, the way it's implemented right now, I think the bean name is uh, the fully qualified class name of the client class. It's, it's something that's not the word synth client is, is well, it's important. And because of that, I've got this at auto wired annotation there, which you wouldn't normally have in a Grails application, right? Your things are automatically auto wired by name. But because I don't want to auto wire by name, at least in this version of the framework, um, that, that's the reason that I've got the explicit at auto wired. Uh, so we'll see what shakes out there. May, maybe what we'll end up doing is coming up with a bean naming um, contraption that will generate bean names that don't require you to use the at auto wired there, but uh, we'll see. But th that's why the at auto wired is there right now. And if you build uh, proof of concepts like this with milestone one of Micronaut, uh, know that you're going to need to uh, mark your uh, Grails artifacts with at auto wired if you want to inject the, the Micronaut beans into them because of the bean naming thing. So all that makes sense? Good. Um, and it was one last piece of that. Yeah, so the bean post processor, this is a, a spring bean post processor that's being added to the spring application context. And I'm explicitly adding it um, by adding a line to my resources, that, that groovy file here. Um, one, of the, one of the things that will likely evolve is we'll end up with a Grails plugin for Micronaut and it will provide a number of capabilities. One of the things it could do is, uh, is manage this for you. So instead of you having to add all of these bean post processors for all the different Micronaut types, uh, all the different types of Micronaut beans that you want to inject into your Grails app, one of the things the plugin could do is provide some kind of configuration mechanism for you to say, hey, get all the clients, get all the X, Y, and Zs, provide a list of classes, and then the plugin can automatically add all the corresponding bean post processors to the Spring application context. None of that exists yet, uh, so there is no Grails plugin for Micronaut. Um, and right now, if that plugin existed, really all it would be doing is allowing us to eliminate this line of code, but we'd be replacing it with some config you'd have to express someplace else. Um, so more, more is likely to, or more is certain to evolve around this uh, integration, but uh, around this particular uh, feature. Um, but what's there now is already compelling and usable, and I, I think that demonstrates, just looking at this, wherever that bean post processor went, um, right? This is, so don't think of this as a Micronaut app. It's not a Micronaut app. This is just a Java app that wants to create a Micronaut Spring application context and do something with it, right? And the specifics are what I just described. Um, but any Java, Java application could do the same sort of thing. So if you wanted to write a Spring Boot app, that, uh, that wanted to use our HTTP client, that would work pretty much exactly the same as it does in the Grails app. If you wanted to just write a standalone Java app that didn't have anything to do with Spring and you wanted to take advantage of um, Sp uh, Micronaut's um, HTTP client stuff, you could do that, right? In your Java program, you can create an instance of this Micronaut default context, get the client beans from it, and then go to town and now you're taking advantage of um, the uh, HTTP client stuff that's inside of Micronaut and you're doing that in some other non-Micronaut application, right? You can do that in any JVM application. Thoughts or questions or comments about any of that stuff? Very good. So uh, the, the Grails and Micronaut integration 
um, story is one that's in, important to us and one we will be continuing to in, in, invest in. Um, so there are a number of ways that that's going to manifest. I'm trying to get back to... Um, there, there are a number of ways that, that, that that's going to manifest. Um, so folks are, as I said before, folks are going to want to continue to build monolithic apps with Grails, and they'll want to take advantage of certain aspects of Micronaut that we've developed. This bean bridging contraption that, uh, that we've uh, recently developed is just one example of that. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, more, as I said, we'll, we'll almost certainly end up with a Micronaut plugin for Grails 3, and it'll, do, it'll take care of this and potentially other stuff. We'll see how that evolves. But we want to enable folks, uh, as I said before, remember that it's not either or, right? It doesn't, uh, your decision doesn't necessarily have to be, should I build a Grails app or should I build a, uh, a Micronaut app? For some applications, one or the other is going to make perfect sense. And for some applications, you'll want to tie them together. And I think the HTTP, the reason I picked the HTTP client uh, in particular for, for this demo is I think that is one of the things that's sort of easiest to think about w why you might want to use that outside of a Micronaut app. And it's, uh, it's totally practical, right? Grails I'm going to start doing that myself in Grails applications that have to make um, uh, uh, calls to, to REST backends just because it's, it's super duper slick. You get all the failover stuff that, uh, that micro everything around the HTTP client uh, capabilities that Micronaut has, now I get to have that capability in a Grails app almost for free. So we'll continue to make sure that uh, uh, all the aspects of Micronaut that make sense to be applied in a Grails app, that we provide a simple way to do that. So I hope you found that, uh, found that interesting. Are there any, any questions or comments about anything that I've mentioned here today? Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and that's really what we've got here. So let's, uh, let's clarify that. So consider the back end as its own application, doesn't it? There's no HTTP client in it, it's just a REST API. It happens to be a Grails app here, could be anything, right? That's totally separate from the UI web application, which is where all this interesting stuff is happening. So somebody has built this back end service that I want to call. In my application, where I want to consume that thing, that's where I want to write this interface. This is not in the backend app. This is my application that wants to call the backend app. I write this interface. This is where the Micronaut stuff comes into play. Micronaut at compile time generates all the stuff that it takes to make these, uh, do the, the service discovery and make the HTTP calls. And now in my application, I can interact with one of these to call that backend service. But the fact that these two apps happen to be tied together here in one multi-project build Forget about that, right? There are two separate apps that could have been developed uh, completely independent of each other. So the client needs to know what, uh, what URIs are available, right? So you'd have to know there's something at slash synths, and you have to know what to expect to get back. Um, but you don't have to have control over that backend service. You're just calling someone else's service. Is that making sense? And does that address your comment? Right? Yeah, yeah, so uh, that, that, that's a good point. So instead of this existing inside of this UI library or this UI app, that could exist in a library of its own, right? And then the UI app could depend on that library, but so could lots of other apps in your enterprise. And now uh, all those apps would, um, uh, would be sharing this synth client and whatever other client stuff you developed. The, yeah, so this synth client wouldn't have to be defined in the UI app. It could just be a dependency that the UI app pulls in. That makes perfect sense. And if you had lots of JVM apps that were calling the same backend services, that would make perfect sense, right? You'd want to do that. You'd have a, a team put, managing either a library of all your clients or maybe lots of libraries that have all your clients in it. And if I want to make uh, calls to backend remote services uh, from some JVM app, I pull in the corresponding client library and use it in my app um, the, the same way I'm using it here. It just wouldn't be defined in my UI project. That makes perfect sense to me. Want to follow that or have any follow-on comments around any of that? 
Any questions at all? Yeah. Yeah, there are different ways to version uh, REST APIs. One is uh, you put the version number in the, uh, in the URL, right? So this could be going to slint slash uh, v1. The other one could be, we could have another method going to v2, and now you're, just, you're really just calling two different endpoints. Uh, I think there's support for uh, a version header. Can you specify a version header? You can't, you kind of can. You can do this. You can say version and make this... Um, what do you do? Is it header? Is that right? Yeah, this is the interface. Oh, do you mean? You can do it there as well, where I just did it, but. Uh, and what would it be? Oh, yeah, but then the, what are you doing here? I'm learning right while you are. Ah. Yeah. Without the colon. Value? This is crazy talk. This can't possibly work. Oh, like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what I, now what, what you're saying makes more sense to me. So, uh, yeah, so if you do that, now you've got two different interfaces that are associated with two different versions of the API, right? Uh, with this approach, you could have one interface, and when you invoke the method, you specify the version, and that becomes an HTTP header um, that uh, the other end needs to respect, right? Whatever you're calling needs to be looking for that, for that header. I've actually got an example. Well. So something uh, along those lines does in fact work. Rather than try to dig for an example that might or might not work, I'll just say that it does work. There, there's definitely a way to get there. Any other questions about any of this stuff? All right, so as I said, the HTTP client is just one example of a thing that's in Micronaut that you might want to use in other applications. That's why I picked it to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, tease through here this, uh, this morning. Uh, there's more, there are other aspects of Micronaut that will make sense to be used outside of Grails apps. And one of the things, I mean outside of Micronaut apps. And one of the things we'll be doing, we've already got lots of example projects out in our GitHub repo. And we've got lots of uh, Micronaut guides evolving already. Uh, one of the things that we'll be uh, working on between now and when we get to release is even more examples, more articles, more videos, tutorials, all that stuff. And a lot of those uh, you'll see specifically focused on the relationship between Micronaut and Grails, just because we want to enable folks to continue to have success with Grails and get to take advantage of a lot of the stuff that's uh, evolving as, as part, of, uh, part of Micronaut as well. So keep your eyes out for all of that in the coming months. Uh, we still have lots of work to do, and you'll see the uh, benefits of the, that work um, evolving. Yeah, Eric. Uh, so it's not going to take over the RxGorm HTTP client. Um, so the RxGorm HTTP client still exists. Um, and that's really for, yeah, so, so there's overlap there, but this doesn't replace that. I don't think. Do you agree with that, Graham? The HTTP client stuff does not replace the RxGorm implementation. There's overlap, and you could do some things with either. But I think RxGorm will still be relevant. but it's specifically ORM, it's not general remote call stuff. I think both will continue to exist. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, come by the table, uh, one last thing. So I mentioned the uh, Raspberry Pi contraption that I would like to, to show off. Uh, also, we're giving away a, uh, an Amazon show. Uh, that you'll see it in the box out there on the table. We're also giving away an autographed copy of uh, Groovy in Action 2nd Edition. Uh, both uh, Paul King and Guillaume LaForge are here uh, this week and have signed the thing. Uh, so we're giving, uh, giving that away as well as a bunch of Micronaut and Grail shirts. 
uh, come by and just sign up for uh, the raffle, and uh, we'll be drawing for shirts all throughout the day, today and tomorrow, and then tomorrow we'll be giving away the, uh, the autograph book and the, um, uh, the Amazon show, and if you win a t-shirt along the way, that does not exclude you from um, winning the, the big items tomorrow, so uh, don't uh, wait to sign up because you don't want to w- waste your drawing on a t-shirt when you might win an Amazon show. Uh, if you win a t-shirt, that doesn't pr- that you're not taken out of the drawing for the bigger stuff tomorrow. So come by and see us at the table, and uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>